There we go. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Hey. I put this in my pocket or something? Yeah. Just not next to your phone. I don't have my phone on me. Okay. Whoa. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Stop. Okay, so, um, wow, that's really loud. Um, okay, cool. So, I'm Kayla, if you don't know me already. Hi. Um, so, yeah, like Jared said, um, I don't know, it's been on my heart for a little while. I've been through a good amount this past year, um, and I really feel like I would really like to encourage and fill you guys with hope from my story. Um, so I kind of how I wrote it out, um, I want to take you guys on a little journey from my life in the past five years. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy and get something from this. So, you guys ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so in 2013, when I was 21 years old, one of my brother's really good friends had asked me out on a date. When I said yes, he called me immediately and we discussed how maybe it's not the best time to tell my brother Justin. We were both afraid to tell him because we didn't think he would respond in a loving way. Now in case any of you guys are not aware, but because I wasn't, anything that starts off as a lie is a huge red flag. Um, so. I don't know if anybody else has done that before, but just make sure you're evaluating your relationships and the things you do in your life. Because if you're lying, you're living in darkness and God wants so badly to bring it to the light. Um, so a few months after, um, him and I basically hung out every single day, really got to know each other a little bit more. Um, I randomly just stopped hearing from him and it really broke me. Um, he ended up dating another girl and I was forced to move on. And during that time, my brother Justin ended up finding Jesus, and the transformation that had occurred in his life was like black and white. It was different. I always grew up in the church, but never understood who God was, except he was the big guy in heaven. When I saw the transformation in him, I knew that there was more to God than I thought, and I wanted to find out more. So I started talking to my cousin more, did some Bible studies with her, and by the grace of God, he led me here to CC Nagi. It was never like me to do things by myself. I was always afraid of what people would think of me. But God gave me the strength without me realizing it and led me to this church home by myself in the end of spring, early summer of 2014. I loved everything about it. I came in and was immediately greeted by Julie and then sat down and a couple, um, a couple of other people came and welcomed me with such a loving approach. It was something I never experienced before and I knew I was meant to be here. After attending consistently, things changed in my heart and I accepted Jesus into my heart and life as my Lord and Savior. But little did I know, during that time I was battling with something called shame. This shame, that I had no idea what it even meant, was running my life. I stepped into my walk with the Lord, excited but not knowing anything. Towards the mid to end of the summer, into, um, summer 2014, I met a friend at church who saw something in me that I never saw. He saw me through the lens of Jesus and chose to try to help me see those things too. I was always afraid and I never felt comfortable talking with people unless they came up to me because I didn't want them to think I was weird for randomly approaching me, or for me randomly approaching them. So <laughs> I would choose to isolate myself and let the fear of not being good enough be the driving factor of my life. Thankfully. This friend of mine pushed me to step out of my comfort zone and meet everyone in the church, which then started lifelong friendships and support that little did I know I would be desperately needing. A year or so later, um, my past creeped back into my life and the lie with my ex continued where we left it. He never wanted to officially commit. His famous line was, we're just friends. He wanted all of the perks of a relationship but never wanted to actually be in one with me at least. How did this make me feel? Like I wasn't good enough. Was I aware of these things at the time? Absolutely not. I was caught in my emotions and shame and the feelings that I had for him. And because I never thought I was good enough, I did everything in my power to become good enough. I dropped everything in my life in a minute to be with him or help him in any way that I can. I would call out of work, I would cancel plans to help him study for school, I would stay at his house and take care of him when he was sick, 
I was by his side when he was hospitalized. I did everything I could think of to be, to be the perfect girl and to be wanted by him. He had all control and power over me. I lost my identity and I found my identity in him. I even started to act like I liked things or force interest in things to connect with him more. And when he would get upset with me, he put me on punishment and would not talk to me for a few days or a week. And during those times, I would be lost and uncomfortable because I had to face me and me alone. I forgot who I was and I only recognized the me with him. And at some point, God came back into my life because he was touching his life. We met a homeless guy on the boardwalk in West Haven after we went for a run and saw that he was praying. And my ex looked at him and said, we are in agreement with you, brother. And the homeless guy looked at him and asked if he can pray for him. And he said yes. And we all came together and started crying over what this man was praying and the, Lord, and the way the Lord entered into our hearts. Later that day, we were talking about being saved and what that meant. And he asked me if I was saved. And I hesitated and I said, I thought I was, but I don't know anymore. And that's when my eyes opened. I prayed, Lord, I need you in my life and I'm living a double-minded life. So if he is not supposed to be in my life, I need you to intervene because I am too weak. So about three to four months later, when I took my really good friend to Newport for her bachelorette party, we went to a vineyard, and as I looked up during our private wine tasting, I see him and another girl holding hands walk right by me. Now I wanna pause for a second because this was not a coincidence. I was in a completely different state at a vineyard. I booked this trip months in advance as well as the time we would be at this place. He did not know I was going to be there because I didn't tell him. And he barely ever drinks, so it's not like it would be an attraction site for him. The odds of him going there were slim to nothing. So, he then saw me and it was very awkward and he was definitely caught off guard, but he held her hand and continued to walk as he waved hello to me. I texted him to try one last time to see if he cared that he hurt me, and his response was not what I wanted. I was at a very low point. I called my friends and family who I had lied to in the past, and those I trusted, and I just cried out to them. Now I want you all to understand where I was during this time. I was coming to church a couple times a month, but not regularly because of work, but I still showed up. I was also the director of New Beginnings. I thought because I was still showing up and still doing what I needed to with new beginnings that no one could tell what was going on in my life. I lied to everyone, including people in this church that are so near and dear to my heart. I can speak to two different people through this situation. So person one, if you have a family member or a friend who may be living like this, have hope. I called four people that day. Tabitha, my mom, Julie, and Justin. When I called Julie, I cried to her immediately, apologizing for lying to her, and she loved me through it all. She comforted me, forgave me, and prayed with me. Sorry. Justin was hurt. I called him too, and, but he responded in a loving and a forgiving way as well. When I got back from Rhode Island, I met with Jared, and I told him everything too. And one of his responses was, he knew that I was living a double-minded life. Not to the extent, but generally. But the only thing that he could do was pray for me. If he called me out, it would have stopped coming around, and I was too blind and deaf to really hear the truth. And honestly, a part of me knew, knew the truth, but never wanted to hear it. So he prayed for me, and the Lord moved. So hold on to this verse in Philippians 1.19. Paul was imprisoned, and he wrote to the church in Philippi, saying, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, or, or the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. We are called to be in partnership with the Holy Spirit, and his will is for everyone to be saved. Do not give up on that person that you're thinking about. It most likely will not be overnight, but don't stop laboring over them in prayer and give the rest to God. So please, again, if you have a family member or friend or anyone you know that is living this way, never stop praying for them and never give up hope. Because if God has done it in people's lives before me and he did it in my life, he will continue to do it in other people's lives. God never changes through generations or situations. Person two, if you are who I was, 
have hope, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. So back to the vineyard. I was lying in the fields of the vineyard, bawling like a baby, being held in my friend's arms because I lost the one thing that I depended on in this life, the one thing that I thought completed my identity. Looking back at it now, it was God answering my prayers, intervening and rescuing me from destruction. I knew it was no coincidence, rather it was the hand of God moving. So person two, listen to me. I was listening to the song, Psalm 46, Lord of Hosts. And when I was worshiping, the Lord emphasized this one part. Oh God, who makes the mountains melt, come wrestle us and win. For me, I was fighting the Lord for years, big time from within me, knowing where he was calling me and intentionally saying no. That when I prayed for him to intervene, that was the scariest prayer I have ever prayed. But by praying that, he wins, and so did I. I gave it to God and said yes to him, knowing what may happen, which did. But I speak to you now over a year later and say that was the best decision I have ever made. Was it hard? Most definitely. But was it worth it? Absolutely. If you're fighting the Lord on something of this world, give it to him and cross over the finish line and enter into victory. Do not ignore the nudges of the Holy Spirit. I promise he cares for you and whatever you have that you're holding on to so tightly, I promise you he has something so much better, more than you can ever imagine. And another side note I wanted to touch on, as a leader in the church, it is super important that you are truly living a life that exemplifies the gospel and Jesus' love. When I wasn't living like that, but was still leading new beginnings, I was so stressed out, not living and loving people the way I should have. It was all fake. Did the Lord still use me and work through me? Absolutely, because the Lord's going to reach whoever he needs to reach, using whoever, wherever they are. But it was still a problem. That was the other thing Jared spoke to me about in our conversation. And he asked if I'm really ready this time to give it all to God and change my life. Because if not, I need to step down from new beginnings. I said, I'm done and I'm so ready to change and I'm serious this time. But how many times have we heard that? I had to prove myself again. He ended up having to share with the church board my story, and I was a wreck when he told me that, I ha that he had to. I felt ashamed and was very uncomfortable with someone else sharing my vulnerabilities. But after he did, I sat down with all but one person and said, I know you know, my I know, you know but it's my story, and I want to share it with you. And that's what I did. That was challenging in the levels of hurt. Vulnerability and shame, I felt, was undescribable. But again, they cried with me and loved me and praised God for bringing me here. They didn't dwell on the negative. They focused on where God brought me and thanked him for that. So please, if there's something out of this I want you to take, it's that the lies of the enemy place, that the enemy places in our minds in regards to not being real because we won't be accepted or people will think poorly of you, they're all lies. Be real. Be vulnerable and allow God and his people to love you during these times. And if you are living this life and you are in leadership or want to be in leadership, do not give up hope. Surrender it to God and follow him. And I promise you, he will move mountains and you will look at yourself and not even recognize or remember this person that isn't you. You are called to so much more and you are so much more. I can't stress that enough. So, back to the story. When I came home, I entered into counseling with a Christian counselor shortly after that. And that's when she explained to me that I really battle with shame and allow it to run my life. This past year was a journey of finding my true identity in Christ. I'm so used to being in relationships that they became problems and distractions to me. And last year in October, that's exactly what it was. I still wanted to be with my ex. It was still so fresh, and other parts of me just wanted to hop into another relationship to move on. But God's like, what about me? What about my relationship with you? So last year, in October, I made a promise to God that I would not date for a year or even pursue another guy. Rather, I would just focus on God and I. So during my quiet times last year, I, I journaled a lot, and it helped me to be able to see how I was feeling and also to see who God is and allow that truth to consume me. So I want to share a part of my journaling from last year during a week where I was struggling. So this was written on November 2nd, 2017. So I told the Lord on October 29th, 2017 that I'm going to dedicate this next year to solely Him. No guys, this is going to be a season of singleness. But not only that, 
but a season of preparing and equipping me for where he's calling me to be. My heart and mind is not in the right place, and I need to completely, with all my mind, soul, and heart, be invested in learning more about who God is and being confident in my identity in him. I had an amazing morning after that, but then I ended up going to a friend from high school's wake, and it hit me hard. I felt like I was letting God down, that I wasn't giving him my all, and going out into the world and sharing the gospel to the people who need it. I felt as if I were keeping my Jesus contained and not sharing him. And I assumed it was all fear-based. I'm beating myself up because I am placing the entire responsibility of others' salvation on me, when in reality it has, nothing, it has really nothing at all to do with me. The Lord can use me in some way to speak to people, but I'm not the sole reason that someone's going to be saved. If the Lord wants to reach them, he will reach them, regardless of me in the picture or not. But I'm really struggling with that truth. I think it's because I strive to be the best and strive to be a perfectionist. I let those thoughts consume me this entire week that I wasn't doing good enough and that I'm letting the Lord down, that he's looking at his other children well pleased but then looks at me in disappointment. These are all lies. Then I struggle with knowing that these are lies. There's a disconnect with knowing and truly knowing. Once those lies creeped in, I investigated why I'm not saying more to people about Jesus. Well, it's because I care about what people think about me. I care if I say something that sounds stupid and what they're going to think about me. Then I tried to pray through all of that and not care about what others think, but truly care about what only the Lord thinks. But then he brings it to another level by helping me realize the core reason as to why I care about what other people think. Well, my entire life I struggled with that, especially with men. From my high school ex all the way up to this most recent one, with the exception of one, I had to prove to them that I was good enough. And especially with my most recent ex, I never was good enough. So it's easy for me to completely pour into people's lives with everything I have and still worry that I'm not good enough because that's what I went through for many years. The Lord wants to work through this in my life. I prayed to him that I want to surrender all and I'm tired of fighting him on what he wants to do in my life. I'm physically and emotionally exhausted by fighting him. So I want him to prune me and have his way in my life and I need to be okay with it and just come alongside him in whatever he plans. This is something that needs to be dealt with so I can be set free. So I can have a family and not bring this baggage into the mix. The Lord has blessed me with this season to work out all the kinks in my heart and mind and show me who I am. He wants to use me in, a, in mighty ways and I want that too. But I can't rush it because I'm not ready. I need to fight through the Spirit's strength but also allow God to fight for me. Good things don't happen overnight. They take seasons. I need to truly grasp and understand the grace that God is trying to pour into and over my life. The grace that he has already given me. We talked about how the Lord was prepping David. It took 20 years for his prep. And he was constantly on the run going from bad situation to bad situation, from cave to cave. It didn't look or feel good, but God was with him the whole time and was preparing him for what was to come. David needed a heart change, and that's how the Lord chose to do it with him. Then we talked about Peter, how he was bold and said he would die for Jesus, and how he loves him so much, but then he denies Jesus three times in front of everyone. Imagine how Peter felt, like a failure, not good enough. All of those things, but Jesus came back and met with Peter one-to-one -one and just poured out his grace and favor on him regardless. And the Lord wants to do that in my life, too. It's okay not to always be the person standing out trying to make a huge difference. It's not my time yet. I need my heart to get in the right place with God first and allow him to just continue to prune me and prepare and equip me for what is to come. But most importantly, to show me his true love, faithfulness, and grace that he has for my life. When I understand those things, and it doesn't just seem to be words on a page, rather it becomes a reality in my life, then I will be able to minister to the most efficient way into people's lives. Then I will be able to be used to the full potential that God wants to use me in. I need to be patient and trust the process of preparation. I need to know that it's going to be good. Um, wait. It's, sorry, it's going to be painful, but I need to most importantly just trust in who God is and know that he's good. I thank you, Lord, that I can end this night with a better understanding of what is taking place and just knowing that you're good. I thank you that you don't ha I don't have to fake how I'm feeling and what I'm going through, but I'm able to be open about it. 
I thank you that I'm still coming alongside you regardless of my feelings because I know you're good and I can already start to see the good that's going to come from this. Lord, help me to trust in you completely with my entire heart, mind, and soul. Help me to truly just fix my eyes on you and all that I do, Lord, on a day to day. That nothing else matters except you. I thank you for putting the pieces together and filling me with your peace. I thank you for who you are and just the amazing things that are to come. I know I'm not a failure. I'm just in the process of learning. When we learn, we mess up. But it's okay because you teach us in a loving, gentle way, the right way. And I thank you that you aren't mad at me when I do mess up. I thank you that you chose me long before the world was created, knowing how my life was going to be and the choices I was going to make. But you see the things I'm going to do for your kingdom in the long run, and that's worth something to you. That person you created, you know I'm going to walk in it, Lord, and you said I am worth it. I thank you, Lord, for believing in me when I don't believe in myself. I thank you for seeing me in a lens that I don't see through. I ask for new lenses in my life, a replicate of your lens, Lord. I love you so much, Lord, and look forward to continuing in this season of growing into the person you have called upon my life long ago. Jesus, I give my life to you and ask you to have your way. I thank you for loving me more than I know. So, now that you know most of my story, I want to share with you all what I actually went through to get to where I am today, this past year. So, this past year was difficult but amazing. The Lord brought Tabitha into my life, and I truly believe that it's an anointed friendship. She's my Jonathan, and there's no way I would have gotten this far, gotten as far as I did without her walking through life with me this past year. So be encouraged, because God loves relationships of all kinds. He said in Genesis 2.18, It's not good for man to be alone. The, the way we were created is to be in relationships, the most important one being God, but friendships too. Tabitha and, I, Tabitha and I would literally hang out every single day. We would spend so much time in prayer and worship together. We'd cry and struggle together, but really learning what it means to do life together. Whenever one of us was struggling, it always worked out that the other was in a decent place, and we just constantly uplifted each other, and again, prayed, worshiped, and did Bible studies together. Another person the Lord put in my path was Julie. She became my accountability partner. She knew basically everything about my life and situation. And we set up guidelines and mutual understandings of what her role was. I don't know how many of you have had accountability partners before, but they all look different depending on the situation and what you personally need to be held accountable for. In my case, I needed extreme measures and allowed her to have unlimited access to my life whenever she wanted it. And it was amazing and so beneficial. We did weekly Bible studies and just talked about life and prayed together. But I'm sharing this and reiterating it because it's so important not to, um, sorry, not to go through this alone. The Lord brings people in your lives to help you through it. He knows the temptations of the world and he provides always, even if it's just seasonal friends or forever friends. So don't feel like you're a burden or annoying, because I did feel those ways at times. But I learned to be okay that this was going to be a season of receiving over giving. Another thing I did was just constantly surround myself around other believers. For so long, my identity was always attached to whoever was the biggest influence in my life. And that's obviously not good. The people I was hanging around with did not know or serve the Lord. And that was very hard to be around, especially when I was in the middle of trying to find my identity in Christ. So that being said, a lot of people were removed from my life. Some not completely removed, but I don't do life with them. That's the key. I'm starting to see and talk with them a little bit more now because I know who I am in Christ and I'm not easily influenced. But if you are like me and are easily persuaded by your environment and the people around, pray to the Lord because I guarantee he's going to say separate yourselves for a little while because it's not healthy. So, I was involved with our church more. I started going to Sanctuary up in Fairfield every week. I had small groups throughout the week. It was very rare if there wasn't a day that I wasn't doing something that would help me learn more of who God is and the way He sees me. And I can't stress how critical that it is for someone who really wants to live the way God is calling you to and to be able to see yourself the way God sees you. As I studied more about my identity, I would force myself to stand in front of the mirror every day and speak what Christ says about me. I would pray for a greater awareness to see when I'm speaking lies over my life, and then I would have to shake it off and say, no, that's not who Christ says I am. It's a lie. And then come back with the truth. 
This took a good six to eight months for me to do continuously until the head to heart connection occurred. This includes only listening to music that is worthy of praise. If you continue to listen to music, which nowadays to me is degrading to women and speaking horrible things over people's lives, if you want freedom, they have to go. If you want freedom, you have to stop watching movies that do the same thing. I didn't watch a movie for over a year because it brought back memories. These things then bring you into comparison traps. Be aware of that and don't just ignore it. Like Jared preached on November 11th, the enemy will come in and be like, eh, it's fine. It was only once this week that I listened to that song or watched that movie. But then what happens the next weeks? It starts happening more and more and then you forget or lose sight of your worth because you start to compare it with other people's lives. This actually just happened to me in the beginning of October. I was listening to everybody's opinion and then I would go on social media and see a lot of things I desire, like to be a wife and a mother. Then I would start getting upset and playing the why me card. So what did I do? I deleted my accounts and I've never felt more free. <laughs> Um, I don't have to constantly look at people's lives and become jealous. So I can't stress enough like it says in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there are any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's a verse you want to hold tight to and there's a reason it's in the Bible. Paul continues saying, when you do these things and think these ways, the God of peace will be with you. That is a promise and don't ever let go of that. So before I close up, there are two things I want to end on. One, this is just one example of what God can do in, a, in and with a willing heart. Many of you knew only who I am now and didn't know what God and I went through to get me here. The second I surrendered everything over to him and my heart was willing, that is when the mountains moved and the changes occurred. And I don't want you to think that it was so easy because it wasn't, it was hard, really hard. I never experienced God's faithfulness in a personal way before. I always heard stories and saw it happen in other people's lives, but for me, that's not what built my faith. It encouraged me, definitely, but what built my faith was when I experienced it firsthand in my life. So what did I do? I had to trust God first. In my letter I read earlier, I said I was emotionally and physically exhausted. It got to the point where I physically, emotionally, and spiritually could not go on the way I was living. And I had no other choice but to trust and hope that God would be faithful and take that first step. And that's when God proved himself faithful to me. I chose to walk away and go through this challenging but worthwhile season not knowing how or if the Lord was going to come through. Just trusting in his character that I have learned and heard about. And now that I took the first step, that is when he proved himself faithful to me by bringing me to where I am today, by setting me free and transforming my life and making me brand new. Trust him today, and if you've never experienced his faithfulness, take that first step. If you have experienced his faithfulness, continue to remind yourself of those moments and let those build your trust and faith in him. Let those moments lead you to having a willing heart again. And the last thing, Jesus took my shame at the cross. He said it was finished, and when the nails were going into his wrists and feet, he took his last breath. He said, no more shame, no more anxiety, no more depression, no more guilt, no more lies. Whatever you're battling with, it's finished. Don't ever forget that you are more than enough. You're worth it. That's it. You clean up my mess now. <laughs> You know, as uh, so, a couple things. You know, as I'm only saying a couple things, so don't think like, "Oh my gosh, now we're no." <laughs> um, you know, when she, she said she wanted to share, whenever anybody tells me they want to share anything, um, you know, my heart always is, you know, what's the motivation? You know, what's the motivation? Like, why is somebody so interested to stand in front of everyone? 
and share something. What's the motivation? And I knew Kayla, you know, but I needed to hear her say it. And then when I heard it, and, I, and then she was trying to describe it to me, I'm like, well, you know, just share it with me. You know, just like, you know, give me what you got. And, uh, you know, a quarter of the way through, I'm like, oh, man, thank you, Lord, for just rightly aligning the motivation. And now it's really about speaking from the Lord's heart in an appropriate way um, that highlights Him. And just, we're, we're just a piece. You know what I'm saying? We're just a piece. And, um, you know, and then I finished listening to it. She was sharing about it. And I looked at her. And, uh, and I did, and, you know, part of her thing, like, I, you know, I just, it's very interesting. You know, I, I never really walked in some of this before being a pastor. I just know some things sometimes. You know, call it word of knowledge, call it word of wisdom, whatever you want. I just know some things. And don't be like, oh my God, what does he know about me? <laughs> don't do that. Right? Don't do that. It's, it's, that's, not what it's, that's not what it's about. I think it's more of like a, uh, it's like a, it's just, it's like a shepherd thing, you know, I, I don't know. It, it, you, know you get entrusted, you know, being a pastor is not about talking to people, it's, it's about doing life and protecting and coming around and encouraging them and help to champion them. And that's something that, you know, the Lord, He doesn't take lightly. He wants to make sure that His people are cared for and taken care of and, you know, He doesn't want certain things to creep in. And, uh, you know, he, he helps, you know, the shepherd's heart, which I'm just grateful for. Um, so I just hear things. God tells, sometimes it's very specific, and sometimes it's really general. Um, in her case, it was kind of a mixture of both. But, you know, there's been other times, I'm like, wow, where did that come from? Um, but I remember <laughs> we were joking about it, and I was like, Kayla, you don't know how many Sundays. <laughs> or groups of things, or I saw you, and I just wanted to just let loose. And say, what are you doing? You know, just come like I know the deal, and you're not, you're not saying what it is. You know, and um, you know. Listen, here's the reality. The reality is, you know, the, the title of the message is not going to be much of a message. It's just going to be a couple of points. That's it. The reality is, you could be saved and not yet surrendered. That, that's really the reality of the Christian walk. You could say you're saved. And you could even have the appearance of it. That by no way means that someone's life is totally surrendered. And in this day and age, because there's so much image going around everywhere, we can all learn pretty quickly how to say things, how to show up for things, how to look a particular part and even say the right things. And actually other people even commend us based on how well we might be faking it. And then we start to buy into that press and we think we're further along than what we are. And I love the example that, you know, Kayla gave of Peter, you know, he was, that was his deal. Oh yeah, I don't know about them, but I'll die for you. I will die for you. These other guys, I don't know, but I'm in it. And she's like, well, probably on the inside that's where you want to be, but you're not really quite there yet. You're not there yet. And much of this walk is like an, it's like an onion. There's just layers. That first initial layer has to start where you get saved and you give your life over to Jesus Christ and you say, Father, I want to follow you with all that I... You paid a debt I could never pay. And I don't even know what the next step in my life looks like with you, but I know that that's what I need to do. Every single person on the planet has to do that before they come face to face with Jesus Christ. He's the jury and the judge. How does he do it? I don't know. It's not for me to figure out. My job is to give his heart. Show His light. Be a testimony for who He is. That's all of our jobs. And so once that first layer is done, we give our life to Jesus Christ. Then from there, now we're in this thing called the journey. We're in this thing called the walk. And what the Spirit does, He just pulls back layers. He pulls back layers. He says, hey, you going to let me in here? You going to let me in here? You going to let me in here? And so the idea is we grow and surrender, right? We grow and surrender. Um, so I just want to share one quick passage with you to highlight this idea. So go to Romans 12. Well, you're probably already there because I mentioned it before. Romans 12. Verse 1. So it says, Therefore, and probably, a lot of you probably already know this passage. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, right? In view of God's mercy, as soon as we start to lose the fact, as soon as we start to lose sight and vision of His mercy on our lives, it starts to take us other places. As soon as we start to feel like we're entitled, or maybe we deserve it, or we lose fact of the grace and mercy that has been given to our lives through Jesus Christ, 
we start to entertain other things and, and the way we I love how Kayla talked about the lens that she had and that she's hungry for our lens becomes distorted and foggy and, and we can't see clearly when it's not coming through the lens and the filter of his mercy and of his grace her life was drastically and radically changed sure she got saved but now it takes not like a week not like a month it takes kind of a season to understand what that means and to start to see now, now she lived a whole life looking at herself a particular way and now God enters into the mix and the Holy Spirit comes on the scene and now he's like no 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 I need to I want to redefine who you are that takes some time that takes some time so in view of God's mercy in view of God's mercy listen I need God's mercy as much as you do I come to the cross the same exact way as you. Every pastor, every leader, I don't care the number of the people, the, the amount of money they have, whatever. I need, they need, we need His grace and His mercy upon our lives. In other words, I've learned that when I walk through life and I go through life, there are not some days and some situations where I'm like, Oh wow, now I really need His grace and mercy. I used to say that when I didn't quite understand it. Now, I understand it. And I'm like, wow, today, tomorrow, every moment, to be a husband, to be a father, to be a friend, to be a pastor, right? To be a mother, to be a grandmother, to play these multiple roles and things that we have no prayer and no hope for fulfilling out what God has for us apart from His grace and His mercy. No hope. So in view of that, here's what he says. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Here's what that means. Here's like my points. I don't have many points, but here's it. Surrender has not occurred until sacrifice has been provided. Surrender has not occurred until sacrifice has been provided. And what that does, that gets at the heart of the image issue. So maybe we could think, you know, we're really like surrendered or we think we're at a certain place, but until the sacrificial element has actually really been carried out, we're kind of just fooling ourselves. And to be honest with you, it's pretty easy to do this day and age. Really easy. Anybody know anything about that, actually? Yeah. It's easy to fool ourselves to think that we're further along or maybe somewhere that... And then we get into a comparison trap and it's like, well, I'm not like them, you know, so... Man, craziness. Craziness. But here's the idea with the sacrifice. It's not like... You just throw God a bone. Uh, he'll just kind of get whatever I give him. And he's cool with that. Second point is, what we present, he must be able to accept. So that sacrificial part, it's got to be something that he's actually going to say, yes, I accept that. I take that. I'm good with that. So when it, comes over to the, when it comes to the leftover part of our lives, like if we have the time or the energy and just sort of sprinkle them in, you know, somewhere, just get some religion in there. That's not what he accepts. That's not who the God of the Bible is. The God of the Bible is always known for taking the very best right off the top. Giving it unto him. Well, why? Is he just selfish? Does he just want? No! We just sang about it in the song. When you see the cross, some people just say, see sacrifice, they see pain, they see infringement on what they want. Other people that have been walking with the Lord, they, that doesn't seem risky at all. In fact, what they see is they don't see loss, they see gain. They see some sacrifice, but they know it equals freedom. So you better believe that God wants the whole thing. It's only part of who He is and part of His nature. He doesn't just want our wallets. He doesn't just want our sex lives. 
He wants the whole deal. He's like, man, I want my son and daughter wholly and completely. I don't just want part of Julie's heart. I want the whole deal. I married her. I want the whole thing. And if she's going to hold part of it back, like that hurts. It's going to hurt her and it's definitely going to hurt me. And then when it comes around our family, like there'll be an element of dysfunction. It won't hurt, help our kids either. <laughs> right? My boys or your kids or whatever, you don't want part of their lives. Like, man, you want to have access like to them. You want to have the whole deal. And our Heavenly Father is the same way. So we're not really surrendering until we're sacrificing, but honestly, we can't determine what we get to sacrifice. We have to allow him to be able to say that. So that's why I make that second point to say, listen, it's got to be a sacrifice. So he says, you know what? This is legit. I accept this. Look what happens here. Here's, here's the battle. Here's the problem. Here's the dilemma. Verse 2. Do not conform. Everybody say conform. Conform. Conform has the idea that it's happening from the outside. From the outside. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. It's interesting in Greek that means cosmos. Why is that interesting? It's interesting because the world, everything has like a system and like a way of doing things. If you call it, talk about like the athletic world, you're not just talking about NFL or NBA. Or, you're talking about anything that involves any sports. If you're talking about the financial world, you're talking about anything that has to do with money, not just a bank. You're talking about everything that has to do with money, right? If you're talking about any world at all, you're talking about the whole sphere. So when we're talking about the world that wants to conform, we're talking about a world where the enemy, the, de the devil, is a huge influencer. He carries influence and power. And it is his goal and his job to try and leave God out. We constantly live in an environment, in a body, to where its main goal is to shape us from the outside with pressure, with anxiety, with worry, with difficulty, to shape us so we will respond in such a way to where we get used to responding by leaving God out. And Paul's saying, hey, listen, we got to fight that thing. That's going to kill us. It's almost like if we go scuba diving, we're not built to live in the water. I mean, maybe you are. I'm not built to live in the water. You have to take scuba tanks. You got to get the oxygen. You need the flippers, right? You need the whole thing. You especially need the oxygen. Right? The fish, you know, the dolphins, all that. Like, that's their deal. That's where they live. That's their environment. The only way that I could actually survive in that environment is if I'm packing my oxygen and I have what I need. If I'm not bringing what I need from this world into that world, I'm suffocating, I'm dying. If I'm not bringing what I need for that world, from this world, I am dying. <laughs> If I'm not bringing what I need from the heavenly world that I've been born into and received in the arms of Christ, and I'm trying to live this world, we're suffocating and we're dying. And those of us that have tried to do that, and maybe are in the middle of currently doing it right now, you are feeling the pressure and the weight. And I'm saying, man, there's a whole other way. It's not to just sit back in reactive response to the shaping that the world's trying to do. Because a lot of people, that's their answer. Well, it's like, okay, I'm just going to try and account for everything, and their head's like on a swivel all the time. And they're thinking about every wrong thing and everything that could go wrong and trying to anticipate everything and just trying to react. That is not God's answer to the problem. What's his answer? Go a little further. But be transformed. Let's say transformed. The idea there is it happens from the inside. Transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. So you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Everyone's like, what is God's will? I want to do God's will. What is God's will for my life? Man, I'm to be faithful right now. You, that's where you start. And it starts to unfold. The idea is it has to happen from the inside. And listen, the, the word in Greek sounds like a word in English. 
I'm not, I'm going to botch the Greek, but the word is metamorphosis. Oh, wow, maybe you might know something about that. Caterpillars, butterflies. That's the picture and the imagery. If I had some here, I would use it. But that's the imagery and the picture for the Christian life. It's not to be shaped by the outside and molded by the outside, but to be transformed by the work that's going on the inside and then it comes out of the outside. An interesting thing is like it takes some time for us to realize and get on the same page with the Holy Spirit with what he's talking about. It takes time. It takes time. It takes seasons. And the other truth, the other fact of the matter is, you know, a lot of that timetable, yes, God is in control of that. But listen, we also play a part. And for some of us, we extend that way beyond what we need to. And then some men, they just respond and they just get on that thing and they're going. And that's awesome and super encouraging. But for a lot of us, it's just waste a lot of time fighting. We waste a lot of time fighting. And we're trying to like, well, I'll just swim to the surface for the oxygen. And then I go right back down. And then I go right back. And then I come right back down. And he's saying, listen, I got the whole tank, everything all filled up ready. You will thrive and you will be amazing. Just trust in me and go my way. And so, I want us to grow in the fact that we just go after those layers of surrender. Because listen, there's layers of surrender in my life that God makes clear. In your life, we're all in different places. And it's not done in a moment with one prayer in a pew or in a chair or at an event or at a conference. It's good to start there. That's where you start. You never have that moment where you say, Jesus, you're my Savior and I give my life to you. You never do that. We can't even have the conversation. And then your soul is destined to hell. And that's not at all where we want to go and the way we want to do this thing. Jesus made a way. It doesn't even have to go like that. And the interesting thing is, listen, all this stuff, and I love what Kayla said, you know, she could be encouraged by other people and their stories and what they say, but she made a point of saying her faith was built. It was encouraged by others and stirred up, but it was built on what she surrendered to the Lord and then what He did in her life. So Father, help us to be a people that just surrender. Father, help me to be a person. Help me to be a man. To lead by in humility. Surrendering when I hear your voice. Responding when I hear your truth. Father, help us not be known for procrastinating and trying to find reasons for why we shouldn't. So Spirit of Truth, make us soft. Soft in the right places, firm in the other places. And I just thank you, Lord, that when we entrust people to you, you do deliver, Lord. You are faithful, God. I just thank you for that.